This episode of Let's Argue About Plants is brought to you by Bluestone Perennials, a second-generation, nationally-renowned mail-order nursery. Bluestone offers thousands of varieties of perennials, grasses, ground covers, and shrubs for shipment throughout the U.S. All plants are grown in natural fiber, biodegradable pots that plant directly into the soil. All plants are 100% guaranteed to grow. Visit bluestoneperennials.com today. Hello and welcome to another edition of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm associate editor here at Fine Gardening Magazine. Hey everybody, it's Danielle Sherry. I'm the executive editor at Fine Gardening, but you guys know this by now. Happy spring, Carol. It's officially starting to feel like spring. It is. This is the best time of year. I love it. It is. Okay, tell me, all right, before we get into today's topic, which, folks, you're going to want to hear this one because it's a good one, but um, tell me what's going on in your garden. So what most are you most of, excited about? Most of the things I'm most excited about are actually still coming in and out of my house every night. I start a lot <laughs> of seedlings, and um, this year I'm doing some cool ones like clary sage and Thai mm-hmm. basil, as an ornamental, lots of dahlias from seed, which have just gotten started, um, nice. you know, and tomatoes and, you know, boring stuff like that. But yeah, lots of nice. azure sage too. As salvia Ooh. azuria, that's a fun one. Nice and blue, super yes. blue blooms. Oh, nice. Yes. I know I saw your Instagram and I was like, oh, it is officially on like Donkey Kong at Carol's house because she is, she's a master seed starter and flats and flats. It's like a full-time job, Carol, these seedlings. Oh, I have a full-time job. This is like my my after work work <laughs> and before work work. <laughs> it's your second full-time job. Yeah. It's your second full-time job. Well, I was out in the yard or in the garden yesterday and I was getting very excited about the epimedium starting to put on a show and I think it's a little bit early because we had a super mild winter but I have a couple of epimediums that are right around our chimney so I think it's you know it creates that little microclimate and pushes them just a bit ahead of when you know some of the other epimediums in my garden and oh man they are going bananas and it's so beautiful right now I know they're subtle but gosh I love them and yeah and I'm watching the magnolias and going oh please oh please let it not be a late frost I really don't want a dirty tissue tree this year (laughs) please 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 all right well speaking of my magnolia tree today's topic is trees flowering trees for every season so we're gonna pick our favorite or the tree that we had great photos of for (laughs) spring, summer, winter, and fall. Was this a tough one for you to do, Carol? Uh, Not really, but some of those seasons are a little tricky, right? Winter, there's not a lot that blooms in winter and fall too, but I, I I found some good choices. I decided to go down south for my winter choice because I was like, you know, I can't talk about a witch hazel again. So I I decided to opt out of, you know, winter blooming in my yard, which is basically my witch hazel. And that's about it. So I I traveled down south, which all people should do when it's cold out in the winter. Um, All right. Well, do you want to kick us off with your do you want to start with spring? Let's start with spring. And okay. and I'm starting with a magnolia, too. So here we go. <gasps> Folks, we did not plan that, just so you know. We are seasoned podcast professionals, but that was not planned as a transition. So, yes, <laughs> nailed it. Here we go. So um, I have... I have talked about magnolias before. I love them. They are they are so much fun. Uh, a great, great spring flowering tree. And the one I want to talk about today is called Wada's Memory. It's um, a, a magnolia cuensis hybrid. Um, Wada's Memory is named after the fellow that actually sent uh, this, this seedling 
to the United States. So the fellow's name is Koichiro Wada, and he was a Japanese nurseryman in like the 1930s to 40s. And he he didn't travel to the United States very often, but he did have friends in the United States. And so in about 1940, he sent a seedling to the Washington Park Arboretum. And and it, it grew for years there. And, and in the 50s, his friend Brian Mulligan introduced it as Wattis Memory. It's kind of funny because he was not dead yet. Oh, so, oh right? no. He, oh, that's he was, unfortunate. Well, I know. It sounds like it's like, oh, we fondly remember him. He was very much alive when this plant was oh, named God. after him. <laughs> you couldn't have dropped the memory, you know, it couldn't have just been, you know, cultivar wattis. I mean, you know, I don't know. But you know, the other thing that it might be so he, uh, this, this nurseryman lost his family in World War Two. And so it okay. might be in memory of his family of the other okay. wattas. And so you know, but okay. a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful tree, a great memory of this guy who also uh, introduced rhododendrons. He was very active and, and did some excellent um, breeding work. And um, there are still other cultivars and other genera that are named after him. Oh. Um, so this is a deciduous magnolia. And the magnolia cuensis are cross between two Japanese species, magnolia cobus and magnolia salicifolia. And the, these crosses occur naturally in the places where the uh, native ranges of these two magnolias overlap, but also people do these crosses on purpose. And I think that's what uh, Mr. Wada was doing with this one. And so um, it, it's it's not one of those saucer magnolia types. It's, it's the flowers are white, they're single, they're kind of droopy or trailing mm -hmm. if you prefer, um, but the plant produces them in, in such profusion. It's just like this explosion of white petals. And it happened uh, when I photographed the, the tree that you'll see in the show notes, that was mid-April at the Scott Arboretum in Swarthmore College in Eastern Pennsylvania. And so it's almost late in the, enough in the season that you don't have to worry so much about the getting hit by those late frosts. That's um, amazing because that's yes. such an issue for, you know, those of us in more northern climes when it comes to magnolias. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's just so heartbreaking when, you know, you're, you're getting ready for your saucer magnolia to go and boom, <laughs> freeze overnight. And now it's brown instead of pink. Very mm -hmm. tragic. Yeah. So um, this one is, is sort of a little less prone to that. And the scent is just amazing also. So you've got um, these, you know, and it blooms at an early age. So if you plant a young tree, you're much more likely to start getting flowers earlier in its life than uh, a lot of the other magnolias that take longer to bloom. Uh, but the scent, some people call this one a, an anise magnolia because the scent is kind of spicy. Other people describe it as like an orange blossom scent. But it's like when I look at that picture that we have in the show notes, like I can smell it. It, is, it was just like, it, it was just this enveloping, beautiful scent that you could smell from like, way 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 far away super cool how um, big does this one get carol this, is this, this like is, huge or is this a tiny like star magnolia size it will get big it will okay. it will get 25 to 30 feet tall maybe 15 to 20 feet wide what's nice about it is that it has a nice tidy habit sort of almost like a pear-shaped habit sort of tapering at the top um, and that's something that sort of sets it apart from other deciduous magnolias that can get a little bit loose and untidy, if, especially if they're planted in shade. But it will take full sun to partial shade and it'll keep that tidy habit even if it gets a little shade. Um, and like all magnolias, it likes, you know, good, rich, well-draining soil, like don't skimp on the soil. This is a, a lifetime investment this is going to be a very long-lived tree and it will just get better and better with age that's amazing so i'm guessing since it was at swarthmore um we're in the zonal game what is the zonal range on this one so, sorry about that i forgot to mention zones no, no, five okay. to eight. Oh, okay nice nice so pretty you know because 
you get into magnolias and we all know, you know, we love those magnolia grandifloras, but zone seven, not in the game. So that's, that's a pretty low range for a magnolia into zone five. That's be- that sounds beautiful. I mean, <laughs> I, this podcast is so dangerous, especially in spring, because, you know, you've already got your plant list going of like, okay, I'm going to focus. What am I really going to get this year for the garden? And now we just keep adding to the list. <laughs> but that one might have to make my list. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. So spring. Um, if anybody rolls their eyes when I talk about this plant, forgive me, because i I know that I have mentioned it on this podcast at least once, if not twice before, but it was earlier episodes. This is my house fire plant. So, you know, like they talk about if your house is on fire, what's the one thing that you would save? Well, which for me is first my husband, then my dog, then photo albums. But (laughs) if my garden was on fire, this would be the the plant that I would save. Not just the tree, like the plant. This is my number one. And it's Donnie Golf Chinese Red Bud. So it's Circus Chinensis Donnie Golf. And people are always like, wait, what is she saying? Because I have marble mouth. It's E Golf, which is the letter E and golf, like as in the master's competition. So E G O L F. And this is a dwarf red bud. Now I know we're going to get, you know, emails as we do and people are gonna say why aren't you doing Circus candidensis the native tree well i'll tell you why in a minute but primarily i planted this species because i needed a dwarf tree a truly dwarf tree and i have Circus candidensis and it is now probably about 25 feet tall it's a biggie now donnie golf 10 feet tall by 10 to 12 feet wide. This is a baby. It's a baby redbud, multi-stem, suckering tree that has a gorgeous silvery bark to it. So in winter, it looks almost like a shimmering skeleton, which I just think is absolutely beautiful. We don't have a lot going on in winter, so maybe that's why I think it's beautiful. But come spring, and right now, late March, early April, all of a sudden, these weird swollen buds start appearing right out of the bark, just totally out of the bark. And honestly, I noticed that it's starting to happen when the chickadees start attacking the tree because they like to pick at those swollen buds. It must be, you know, one of the first things that they can eat in the garden in my area. So I'm like, oh yeah, it's starting to happen. Now those eventually swell up to these bright, bright, bright red magenta pea-shaped flowers that come right out of the stems, right out of the bark. And it is just spectacular and those continue to swell and increase and they're you know they're tiny blossoms on their own but they cluster together in almost this gumball like fashion and you'll see in the show notes I have this dwarf tree right off my patio up the front entryway so I see this tree all the time and it is just absolutely spectacular um gorgeous flowers we already talked about winter Come spring, late spring, when the flowers start to fall. Now, I'll get like a good month and a half of flowering off of this, this Donny Golf. Then the, fla- the leaves start emerging and the foliage is just lovely. It's perfectly heart-shaped leaves that are about the size of a large child, small woman's hand. Like they are just lovely. It's throws out this beautiful canopy it's slightly vase shaped great for a little bit of shade in the corner of my patio you know it's not that tall but it casts some shade which is great and then come fall it turns this brilliant golden color so the leaves start to transition in patches so you'll have green and then you'll have slightly chartreuse and then you'll have golden yellow and the tree is just doing this technicolor dream coat effect which is just amazing um it is a fabulous fabulous tree it is my house is burning down my garden's burning down tree and it's deer resistant It's also, which I have a lot of deer and they tend to nibble on, you know, especially spring blooms, i.e. my magnolia. And it's also juglans, 
resistant to. So, you know, a great understory tree if you're looking for something to plant underneath black walnuts, if that's an issue for you. So full sun to partial shade, well-drained soil. I have it in the worst soil possible. It was an area that I just didn't have the time. Well, or I was lazy and didn't amend prior to planting. And it just does an amazing, amazing job. Um, 13 years in for this tree with me, and it is topping out at about 10 feet tall. So it really does stay nice and compact. Zones 5B to 9, I know people say all the time, oh yeah, it's listed as zone 6, 7 sometime. No, I, I'm a solid 5B even before they updated the maps. So I'm, I'm saying that it definitely will survive in zone 5B and um, just a fantastic tree. And hey, Listen, if, you know, a, a dwarf Chinese redbud isn't your, your jam, I would say for spring trees, you could not go wrong with any redbud. We have a great article online at finegardening.com that I believe was written by Mark Wethington. Did yeah, I get was. that right? Yeah. All right. Check it out. If if this particular redbud isn't your cup of tea, there is a redbud for every season, every reason, and every garden. All right, Carol. Moving into, are we going to go in order? You want to do summer next and we'll just keep rolling? Let's do summer. Let's go through the seasons. Okay. Give me your summer. All right. So for summer, I thought I would talk about sourwood. That's Oxydendrum arboreum, although spell check really, really wants that to be arboretum. <laughs> and I had to fix it on our website because autocorrect changed oh, no. arboreum to arboretum. Anyway, <laughs> Oxydendrum arboreum, that zones five to nine, nice big range. Um, it was most recently featured in our magazine in Dr. Andy Pulte's wonderful cover story in issue 216, and that was five, nine fantastic flowering trees. And um, this was his one of his summer selections. And this is this is another one that gets nice and big, 20 to 30 feet tall, 10 to 15 feet wide, um, likes the full sun, maybe a little, actually full shade, up to full shade. So full mm -hmm. sun to full shade, so flexible with its light requirements, moist, rich, acidic, well-drained soil. Um, this is an Eastern United States native, and it first blooms in mid to late summer. So where Andy Pulte is in the Southeast, he says early July. So this is, this is one may start blooming around the 4th of July. Um, and in fact, the photo that we have in our show notes, I think it, it was tagged that it was taken on the 4th of July. Um, it's, I think this is a very cool native tree, but it is not very well known or widely grown. And it, the problem might be that terrible common name of sourwood. Like yeah. who really wants to plant something called sourwood? It was named after the leaves. The leaves taste sour and less enlightened generations use them medicinally. <laughs> I do not. I, I don't think we should recommend that. Um, but it, it it does have a better common name of lily of the valley tree. And honestly, mm -hmm. I think if we called it that, more people would grow it. The flowers are like lily little lily of the valley flowers without the invasive tendencies, <laughs> right? Score and and in great perfusion on these these cool like droopy looking panicles that you know have like almost like this windswept look uh, even when it's not windy and the flowers per persist for several weeks beekeepers love them because uh, bees that gather the nectar from these flowers make excellent honey and there is an extended season of interest because even after those little lily of the valley flowers drop, the panicles are still there and you get multiple weeks of interest as the seeds develop well into fall and hold them pretty much through the end of fall. And then it also has great foliage, these large, shiny, deep green leaves, which in fall will turn, depending on where the plant is sited, either red or purple or yellow, and different populations will have different colors. Some people um, describe that the color change as like wine splotches appearing on the mm -hmm. leaves. 
So it's, you know, it's pretty dramatic. And that's, you know, again, sort of a, a, a long period over which the leaves are changing. It's, it's something new and interesting to look at every day. Um, so yeah, it's a sweet, sweet native tree with like a sour sounding name. And I, I honestly, I don't grow it yet myself, but I think more people should probably be growing this. Carol, it's it's on the smaller side, right? Like for a tree, I mean, we're not talking like 50, 60 feet or am I, do I have that? Yeah, long? no, it's, it's, it's slow growing too. So 20 to 30 feet tall okay. is sort of its max, but it's going to take a while to get there. And then it's narrow. It's going to be like 10 to 15 feet wide typically. Yeah. And so you can fit this into a garden setting without as much difficulty as say, you know, I thought of doing liradendron. Those things mm -hmm. get a hundred feet tall. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you're talking about, you know, smaller trees like when you say smaller i mean dwarf is a different scenario but when you say smaller trees i mean trees get 100 150 <laughs> feet tall maybe not in your lifetime but i mean when you say a small tree and it's only like 20 to 30 feet even 40 feet like that's a small tree and that's yes. like a garden worthy tree too it's yeah. not like planting you know a meta sequoia in the middle of a bed so yeah oh yeah great plant fall color is spectacular just absolutely spectacular i mean when you see a sour wood you're just like whoa that's awesome that's awesome so i like that i you know i'm gonna hop on that for my summer tree hop on that um bandwagon of that 20 to 30 feet tall maybe 15 feet to 20 feet wide you know kind of more narrow than it is tall so a, a nice compact tree and I'm going to go with a stewardia and I'm going to go with milk and honey Japanese stewardia and that's stewardia pseudocamellia zones five to seven. Um, I chose the cultivar milk and honey and I'll explain why in a little bit. But um, this is a true four season plant. I mean, we talk about it a lot and I might've pushed the envelope a little bit with the red bud because yeah, it's got silver bark, but whatever. This truly is a four season tree. Um, it has a gorgeous exfoliating bark um, that gets really exposed obviously in winter when it drops all of its leaves. Um, takes about five years, maybe maybe four to five years before it starts really exfoliating. But the, this bark will peel off like cinnamon sticks. So you're going to get this beautiful kind of gray cream color, which is its, you know, juvenile uh, bark color then it peels away to a reddish brown then you get somewhere in between so it's got this very mottled camouflage look and literally looks like peeling pieces of cinnamon off absolutely spectacular um in summer it's the main event though and we're talking about the same that you had said for the sourwood this is going to be late june early july when um story has come into bloom and they are the most beautiful white camellia type flowers. Um, a star-shaped flower that is just white with delicate rounded petals, a very simple flower with a boss of gorgeous yellow stamens in the middle of it. Um, now I chose the cultivar uh, Milk and Honey, which was developed by Polly Hill Nursery, which is a very famous nursery here on the East Coast. But it was taken from a seedling and a seed strain that they had developed um, or found, excuse me, at Arnold Arboretum in Boston. Um, if you're from the East Coast, even if you're not, you probably know the famed Arnold Arboretum, which is truly a spectacular showcase of all things trees. Um, absolutely stunning. So this little seedling, the reason that it was selected out and bred is it has the whitest of white flowers, but the boss of stamens in the middle is just so bright. It doesn't really go like that brownie color. It is a true honey golden color and it casts onto the white petals that almost make it look like a light buttery yellow blossom. These are big too. I'm looking at my notes here because I want to make sure that I don't over embellish. These blossoms can get up to four inches in diameter. Like that's a pretty big blossom for a tree. And the best part is that they're there's a profusion. Your trees get absolutely covered in these white blossoms. Um, and they're so delicate. 
but they bloom out of these marble, green marble sized buds that are covered in this tomentum, this white fuzz that almost is silvery. So before the tree actually comes into bloom, it just looks crazy. It's got these like silvery marbles all over it, which is so, so cool. Um, I would say uh, milk and honey, Japanese stewardia, and probably stewardias in general, especially stewardia pseudocamellias, have the best fall color of any tree that I have ever grown um, and come across. They are just spectacular. You will get every color imaginable. Red, burgundy, purple, yellow, orange, and just splashed over the tree. And the tree is constantly pushing into these new color ranges. I'm gonna put a, I forgot to, but I will do it before this publishes. I put, I'll put a fall photo of just the foliage on this milk and honey on the website for our show notes. Go to finegardening.com, hit that navigation tab, hit the podcast. You'll get the plant list, folks, and you'll get all of our photos too. But I'll put a photo of this on there and it is just spectacular. It's going to be 20 to 30 feet tall. I already said about 15 feet wide. Zones five to seven. Not a huge range for Astuardia, but if you live in zones five to seven, I would say that this is a great tree for you to grow. Full sun to partial shade and really just, you know, a spectacular tree for bees and for you. All right, we're moving right along. We're into fall, which is making me sad because right now I'm just anticipating spring and summer so badly sitting here in the in the doldrums of winter seemingly in New England. So, all right, we're, we'll move on to fall, which is a spectacular time in the garden, especially here in New England, but across the Midwest and many other places. So, Carol, what was your fall tree? My fall tree, this is the one I cheated a little bit on. Oh, me too, me too. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> fall is hard. Fall it is, is hard. Um, but seven sunflower, I, I'll explain. But, I, you know, I think it does fit the bill for a fall, fall, fall interest, certainly, even though it might technically be not exactly flowers. So we're talking about Heptacodium myconoides, and that is hardy from zones five to nine. Um, it is not a native plant, it's native to China, and its common name is a translation of its Chinese name, and it refers to the fact that the flowers are held in little clusters of seven flowers. And actually, heptacodium kind of means the same thing. So uh, people notice that, you know, those little seven clusters of flowers are pretty cool, and they named it accordingly. Um, this is a nice, it's a nice small tree. It gets 10 to 15 feet or 15 to 25 feet tall, 10 to 15 feet wide. Um, and it is a very, very slow grower. And generally it will be a, a broad vase shaped tree and often multi-stemmed, but a lot of people will train it up. They'll, they'll limb up the lower branches because they want to show off. It, it also has some really cool peeling bark, shades of gray and white. And so in the winter, if you see it, that's what you'll notice. But it is a late summer flower flowerer. <laughs> <laughs> it blooms in late summer. It makes an absolute profusion of tiny fragrant white flowers in those clusters of seven from late August into September. So I thought, well, that's kind of back to school time. So that's almost fall. That works. <laughs> that works. And what's cool about it, it it'll, it'll bloom for several weeks. And then when, the, when those white petals start to drop off, what you'll see are these rosy red sepals, which are actually even prettier and do look a, a lot like flowers. And it'll hold those well into fall. So um yeah it's you know not exactly fall flowering but it will have a fall show and um although it's native to china it is very tough plant and adaptable in many parts of the united states it will grow in even tough urban conditions which not all the plants we're talking about like the urban conditions but but seven sunflowers pretty okay with it um so you might see it you know not as a street tree but you know, in, in a smaller lot in the city. Um, and it's deer resistant, which is great. That um, is great. Yeah. So um, do we, 
I'm sorry if I spaced out. You know, it's early in the morning, but did we talk about zonal range for yes. seven sun? Because it almost looks tropical when you see it, but what it was does. that zonal range? Again? It does. It's huge, though. It, it, it grows into those five to nine. So pre- to nine. most okay. parts of the United States, you can grow this tree. Okay. All right. I like it. And wait, this was, was this one that was featured in Andy Pulte's article on? No. No, but not. it has been featured in the magazine a lot. Okay. This is sort of just like a plant person's plant. You yeah. Know, it's just, it's a, it's just beautiful. It's sort of unmistakable in whatever season you see it. And yeah, you see them at botanical gardens all the time. And yeah, definitely it's been featured on regional pages and Mm -hmm. in articles over the years. I I think we um we did feature a super cool plant too, and I'm just gonna mention this in case you like said that you were out of the game because of the size of this tree. There is a dwarf variety that's a fairly newer cultivar, and it just has the best cultivar name, and it's called I believe Temple of Bloom. Not Temple of Doom, like our our friend Indiana Jones, but Temple of Bloom, and it's a, like a more narrow, fastidious version of this of Seven Suns flower. So um, gorgeous, gorgeous. That was that wasn't really a cheat. I went all out cheater on my on my <laughs> fall tree. All right, let's so, hear it. So this is technically doesn't bloom in fall, but has beautiful berries. So that was cheat number one. And cheat number two is, all right, so technically a large shrub, small tree. So, oh yeah, I cheated full on because, you know, I was going through, I feel like for the podcast, when we go to get ready for this, I go through, you know, photo shoots of different areas of the country that I've been at a particular time of year and just to, you know, dip into other plants that, that I like. And, um, and I go through my own photo reel in my cell phone and, one of the best photos I think that I took from my garden in fall last year was of red balloon viburnum. And that's viburnum, oh gosh, here we go, Rhidophyllides rydell, um, zones four to eight. Its cultivar name though, or its trademark name is red balloon. And I think that that's like the perfect description of what it looks like in fall. It looks like a little kid's birthday party escaped onto the shrub and all these small red balloons got stuck in this dark green shrub. And that's these gorgeous clusters of red berries that eventually transitioned to a dark black purple. Um, Not pretty much inedible for humans, But the birds, especially like the native population of birds seemingly getting ready for the winter that's ahead, attack this shrub like it's a cartoon. You know, you see like these fights happening and the squirrels are trying to get involved and get these these berries too. So it's comical, entertaining, and just a really, really beautiful, beautiful shrub um, slash small tree. And the reason I say like small tree is this gets... 10 to 12 feet tall, if not taller, and wide. I mean, this is a big boy. Um, Full sun to partial shade, alkaline, well-drained soil. Um, It's a hybrid of leather leaf viburnum, which I actually have the straight species in another section of the garden. And the notes that that I researched said that you're going to get a far better berry set if you have another viburnum in the mix for some cross-pollination. So much like blueberries, you know, it's not dependent on having a male and a female, but it is, you're going to get a better fruit set if you have have another species of viburnum in the mix. Um, it has these gorgeous leathery oval leaves, a little bit stouter and rounder than say standard leather leaf viburnum, kind of more in the, I don't know, like an elongated elongated uh, teardrops shape. And in spring, it gets these humble white cluster about the size of a maybe some baseball beautiful flowers really really pretty um some people like the smell i feel like smell is to this smeller um whether it's good or bad i don't like the smell i think it smells like a little litter boxy to me but (laughs) 
Some people say, oh no, it smells like root beer. Okay, sure, we'll go with that instead. The smell is something that like doesn't really project itself. So either way, not a big deal. You're not going to smell it unless you shove your face into it anyway, um, which I wouldn't recommend because the pollinators go bananas over that. Uh, of course, that umble shape white flower is just something they love. So if you stick your face in there to get a smell, chances are you're going to end up with a bee up the nose. Um, so the, I already talked about like that. It's the berries though. It's this fall show that generally starts in late September, early October here in the East coast really starts to transition. First, the berries are green, um, held in these large clusters. Then they start to transition to red. They swell up and then turn black. And it's just an awesome, awesome shrub. Um, it was a, a initially just a grower, not a shower. It didn't really look like much for several years. I would say probably around year four or five. It really started to come into its own multi-stem thicket, really, really lovely backdrop plant. Um, but it took a while to get there. Now that it's, you know, at its mature size in my garden, it's spectacular. Also, you know, you got to love a viburnum, man. That zonal range, 3B to 4, all the way into zones 8 and 9. That's This is another one just like Redbud. There is a viburnum for every garden. So if this particular one, Red Balloon, isn't your cup of tea, trust me, there's a lot of them out there that would be. And most of them have a great fall berry show. So check that out as your fall tree, shrub, something like that. <laughs> All right, Carol, let's bring it on home with winter. <laughs> this was a hard one. This is a hard one. Um, and yeah, there, there are not a lot of, of plants that bloom in winter, but you mentioned earlier, witch hazels do. <laughs> they do. They, <laughs> they sure do. do. And, um, and also, it just so happens, you, you know I've been wait, wanting a witch hazel for years, and I've mentioned Primavera and Helena in previous podcasts, um, but I haven't bought one yet. And so I heard that Broken Arrow Nursery in Hamden, Connecticut was doing a tour of their witch hazel collection oh. in late March of this year. And so I signed up right away, which is lucky because it sold out. It was free, but they, they limited the number of people. And I got in, so that was what? awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the wonders of social media. And I would say to anybody, like if, if you're on social media, follow your favorite nurseries because this is how you're going to find out about these cool events that they do. Um, so the tour was led by the fabulous Adam Wheeler, and it was great. It was absolutely great. And he explained to us the difference between your native witch hazels which are Hamamelis, I think it's Vernalis, I didn't write it down, but um, they, they bloom in the autumn. You're the native ones, and there, there are, I think, three native species native to North America, one that's native to Connecticut and the Northeast, um, but they bloom in the fall. And then the, the spectacular ones that start blooming sort of in January through March, those are your Asian species. But he, he explained to me that, or to the group, that um, usually when you're buying these Asian species, you're buying a graft. The top part is the, you know, the spectacular winter to early spring blooms of those Asian species. Usually the rootstock, at least if you're getting it from Broken Arrow, is going to be our native native witch hazels because it's har hardier rootstock and easier to produce mm -hmm. and and just performs better. So I thought that was interesting. It's like, Super. even if you're, yeah, if you're buying, you know, non-native species, you're still, the rootstock is still native. Um, and so the other, the other thing about this tour is that the weather has not really been cooperating for optimal witch hazel bloom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so- We had a weird winter here in the Northeast. Did. Yeah. We did have a weird winter. And so we were getting these like 50 and 60 degree days in February into early March. 
And that's sort of what triggers these winter bloomers that, okay, spring's on the way, maybe it's time to stop blooming. And so a lot of them uh, had already dropped a lot of their flowers. But like the gold standard of the uh, Hamamelis intermedias is Arnold Promise. And that one was still just spectacular, just gorgeous, yeah. still full bloom. And those those blooms for anybody that hasn't seen it, it's like a it's like a little reddish cup with tiny little gold and yellow streamers coming out all over the plant. Um, on br bare branches. Um, but the thing with Arnold Promise is that it gets really big. They get like 20 feet tall. Um, so although it's like the gold standard of witch hazels, like a lot of people don't have room for it. And so at the end of the tour, we were introduced to Sweet Sunshine Witch Hazel. That's oh. Hamamelis Intermedia Sweet Sunshine. And that was discovered as a chance seedling at Broken Arrow Nursery. That's not the only place you can buy. A lot of places have it now. Um, and it, it stays nice and compact, like 12 to 15 feet tall and wide, um, maybe a little bit bigger as it gets older, but in general stays nice and compact, um, grows in full sun to partial shade. It likes, you know, average to moist, well-drained soils. Um, and it has the same beautiful golden blooms with a little little red bases as Arnold Promise. In fact, like if you cut a branch of Arnold Promise in Sweet Sunshine, you, tell the you, difference. Would, you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two of them. So, yeah, I thought I was like, OK, that's the one I want to buy. Of course, they didn't have it for sale. <laughs> <laughs> they did have many others, and I did. I must admit, I I did buy something, um, <laughs> but I didn't. I wasn't able to get the witch hazel, which which was kind of the whole point of this trip. But I'll go back for it in the summer. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So they did. They did reassure you that they are going to re up the stock, and you're going to be able to get it. So good so. for you, though. That is restraint. That is restraint instead of being like, no, I came for a witch hazel, and I'm I'm going to settle for my second favorite. Good for you. They had Don Egolf Redbud, <gasps> and I almost bought it. I'm like, oh, this is the one that Danielle likes. Oh, but I got Sangu Kaku. Japanese maple oh, instead. Beautiful. That is so. a beautiful choice as well. That is. That is. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I you, you really you can't go wrong with with a witch hazel. Um I am angling towards a replacement. I've had um I've actually had purpurea for many years and it was a cast off from a trade show but anyone from from the East Coast remembers the old New England Grows show. At the end of those shows a lot of the nurseries would be giving away the stock that was in their display booths. And um, I, oh gosh, I think it was Summerhill Nursery. I had scored a purple blooming witch hazel. I've had it for so many years. It's actually moved gardens and houses at least once, maybe twice. And, um, you know, it's just, it's struggling now after so many years. And I believe that that was mostly because it has had horrible infestations of webworms the last several years and which have completely defoliated it despite my best efforts so now it's really struggling every year to to really put on a show so i think it might be time to part ways and um what is it it's sunshine it's sun sweet sunshine sweet and they also sunshine. yeah there's one called amethyst which is pretty cool too and that's the purple that you probably all like right. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe. All right. Add it to the list. Um, for winter, I just decided to go down south. Um, you know, there's on occasions a, a quick trip down into warmer weather, especially in winter, really does, especially a northeastern gardener's heart good. And um, a plant that I sincerely wish that we could grow is camellias. Um, there is nothing like them. They are gorgeous. If you are in that seven to 10 zonal range, gosh, I have serious envy because especially during the winter, seeing camellias come into bloom is just, 
you know, it's kind of like the, the, the peony of the tree family, you know, these big, blousey, gorgeous, Victorian-type blooms that are just, ugh, iconic, iconic. So, you know, one that I fell in love with that I believe was down in South Carolina a couple years ago and had spoken with the gardener of this particular more estate garden, it was Pink Perfection is the cult of our name. It's partial shade. Um, most camellias are. They prefer partial shade. They don't like to get, you know, blasted by sun, but you want to make sure that they're getting some bright light in order to put on the best bloom show. They also prefer fertile, rich, moist, well-drained soil. So, you know, these are these are trees that, that need a good soil base in order to put on their best show. Um, but the flower on this pink perfection is it's perfection. It is a double peachy pink bloom that ranges in size on each tree from two and a half inches wide up to four inches wide. So you really get this kind of variation. Just roses. It just looks like tons and tons of roses on this evergreen, glossy green foliage plant that um, camellias are often multi-stem. A lot of times people will limb them up to give them and select out for the strongest leader to give them a more refined look. But this particular variety, Pink Perfection, um, first came into cultivation in 1875. So they call it one of the true Victorian era camellias. Um, and it's just stunning. Absolutely stunning. Um, slight fragrance as well, kind of um, a little bit on the, the subtle sweet side of fragrance to it. Um, I already said it, it goes the entire zonal range, um, 7 to 10. And I just wish, I wish, you know, it's those those heartstring plants that you really wish that you could grow. So, you know, maybe when I retire and head south, <laughs> <laughs> this will be one of the first selections that I put into my garden. Um, camellias, for the most part, with some exceptions, are pretty small trees. Uh, Pink Perfection, which is Camellia japonica, I should have said at the top, is 8 to 12 feet tall and only about 6 to 8 feet wide. So this is going to stay rather refined and compact in your garden. So, um, yeah, I love it. And it just makes me swoon but I can't grow it. And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about his favorite flowering tree. Well, hello there. You just caught me taking in the verdant splendor of a magical spring morning here in steadily warming New England. I've just been gazing upon a particular treasure that graces my landscape with its regal presence this time of year. The Prunus cerulata royal burgundy, a cherry tree of such magnificence that even Mother Nature herself tips her hat in admiration. Is it my favourite tree? Perhaps. Do I love it because of the subtle nod to the royal family? Likely. But is it deserving of some good old-fashioned gushing? Definitely. Now, some may wonder why I've chosen to wax poetic about a tree when there are countless other marvels to behold in the spring garden. But ah, my dear friends, royal burgundy is no ordinary tree. It is the epitome of botanical majesty, a spectacle of beauty that commands attention in every season. If you plant this tree, you'll enjoy the spring air just a touch more, thanks to the delicate perfume of its cherry blossoms. The petals really are like parasols dancing in the breeze. Royal Burgundy in its prime is a vision of pink and crimson that ignites the soul with a sense of wonder. Earlier, I was standing beneath a shower of pastel pink confetti that made me giggle like a schoolgirl. But its allure does not fade with the passing of spring. No, as the seasons change, so too does royal burgundy, revealing new dimensions of its splendour. In summer, its glossy burgundy foliage provides a striking contrast against the blue sky, casting a cool, inviting shade beneath its branches. And come autumn, it sets the garden ablaze with fiery hues, a final flourish before winter's slumber. This was a regal specimen I first fell in love with in my native range of the UK. But I was fortunate enough to find one stateside and plant it here at my home in Connecticut several years back. It is truly my house fire plant, as Danielle so inelegantly puts it. 
So allow me to raise my glass, or perhaps my watering can, to this stunning tree, which is sure to inspire and delight other generations that will inhabit this space long after I've made my royal exit. Carol, it's always great to hear Peter actually, you know, stick to the script and talk about a plant for once instead of, you know, like rental cars and parking spaces as he has habit to do. You don't like to hear about rental cars and parking <laughs> spaces? Come on now. It's a plant podcast, you know, trying to rein him in. is like herding cats sometimes. <laughs> so how did your herding go for an expert this episode? Who do we have? We have Amanda Bennett. And because she is in the South, she's in Atlanta. She, she had no problem coming up with uh, fall, spring, winter, doesn't matter. They've got it all down there. Oh, that's amazing. All right, well, let's see what Amanda has to say. Hi, this is Amanda Bennett, Vice President of Horticulture for the Atlanta Botanical Garden. And I'll be talking about a flowering tree for each of the seasons. Um, for winter, we'll be talking about Magnolia lavifolia. Some of us learned it as Magnolia unanensis or Michelia unanensis. Uh, I'll also be talking about for spring, Halasia diptera. Summer is Stewardia pseudocamellia, and fall is Hemimalis virginiana. Um, all of these have been seared into my memory in one way or another, and I look forward to uh, talking a little about each of them with you today. The first tree I want to um, talk a little bit about is Magnolia lavifolia or Michelia unanensis. This tree is one of those that has a place in time for me. I can still see it. 15 feet tall, covered in these big white blooms that you would expect um, from, a, from a magnolia. Incredibly fragrant and just standing under it and, and looking up at it. It blooms in late winter, early spring. Um, I think a lot of people on the, the West Coast are a little more familiar with this tree, but uh, more people in the deep south should grow this tree. Uh, Atlanta is right on the line for it. Um, it kind of goes from 8A, 8B into the, the warmer zones down to probably um, 10 or 11 pretty easily. Because it blooms so early uh, here in Atlanta, it can bloom in those kind of, uh, you know, Fate, false summers that, that we get in the winter time, and then it'll freeze again. But for the the glorious moment that it is in bloom, um, where that type of weather pattern happens, it is totally worth it. Um, it prefers full sun. It can take a little bit of shade, um, but it all it will grow well in pots. Um, like I said, it has some beautiful, um, big white, uh, kind of creamy white flowers with the the large. Um, green foliage behind it. It's kind of a, a bright, shiny green, not as uh, muted or olivey as, as some of the other evergreen magnolias. But there's a couple of cultivars out on the market. Um, really a, a beautiful tree. And the fruits, actually, once it finishes flowering, the fruits are um, pretty attractive as well, kind of uh, fading into like a brown type, red type of color. Um, so it's really beautifully attractive pretty much all, all season um, and not one that a lot of people are going to know. So if you have this at your house or like I said, in a large pot, um, someplace that's maybe a little protected if you, if you get some of those freezes um, into the March and April timeframe, um, this, one, this one will take your breath away. So the next tree that I want to talk about for spring blooms is another one that's seared in my memory. Um, I learned it in college. I went to the University of Georgia. So I had Dr. Michael Durr as one of my professors. And um, this tree is, is one I vividly remember him talking about and then actually seeing it in bloom. Um, I now will suggest this tree to anybody um, that, that can grow it. It's uh, happy in zones uh, six um, down to about nine. Uh, so we're squarely here in Atlanta, kind of in its, its happy place. Um, but man, is this a beautiful tree. Uh, some people may know uh, Halasia Caroliniana or uh, Halasia Carolina, um, but Halasia uh, diptera blooms a, a little bit later. It's still staunchly in that spring time frame. Everyone loves to see them in bloom. Um, 
again, anywhere I get a chance, I'll bloom these. And they especially look good when you plant many of them together. Those little, you know, dangling, almost fairy bell type of flowers um, just are are stunning when the tree is completely covered in them. Uh, it's a native, um, which also is, is pretty nice. A lot of the early pollinators really appreciate it. And it, I've seen many, many, many of these trees in that 15 to, t to 20 foot range. I, I think theoretically they can go up to 25 or 30 feet. I personally have never seen one quite that big. I'm sure there's one out there somewhere, but I've never seen one quite that big. Um, but, you know, the, the flowers come on and is covering the tree, the, the bright green foliage. And then, you know, throughout the year, it is a, a lovely structured small flowering tree. So if you have a wooded area or, you know, a lot of trees on your lot, um, it, it's perfect there. A particular cultivar, uh, Magnaflora, does a little bit better with drought conditions. So if you have them planted under some very large established trees, um, it's not it's not going to flag quite as much as some of the others. Um, but in the fall, it has a lovely fall color. It, depending on the year, obviously, it can have some, some pretty nice fall color. But um, this is a great one, uh, yellow gold fall color, if I didn't mention that. But this is a great tree. It, it's like I said, it has a beautiful structure, has a beautiful shape, attracts hummingbirds. And it is really just quite, quite beautiful in the springtime. Uh, there's one particular cultivar of Halasia dipter I want to mention that's uh, Magnophora that is a little more drought tolerant than the species. So if you have it planted under some really big kind of well-established older trees, um, that sh shade drought type of situation isn't going to bother it as much as perhaps the straight species would. Now, if you want a true four seasons small tree. Some people might consider this just a large shrub, um, but if you prune it, it is definitely a small tree. If you want four seasons of interest, hands down, Stewardia pseudocamellia is a great choice. Um, I can't talk en enough about this tree. Um, it has exfoliating bark. You know, everybody loves exfoliating bark. So in the wintertime, uh, you can see kind of these strips and models of gray with a little bit of orange, a little bit of red. But that shows up even better um, in the summer. And I chose this tree for a summer bloomer because when it blooms, it has these kind of, um, I don't know, softball-sized white flowers on them. And as soon as it blooms, it gives it away. Um, if you've listened to the scientific name of pseudocamellia, it gives it away that it is um, related to a camellia. Um, it's in the tea family. So it is a camellia relative. And when you see those white flowers, you can see that that relation show up pretty clearly. But man, it's beautiful in bloom. It's covered in these um, kind of white uh, crepe papery, you know, camellia-esque like flowers on this you know, bright green foliage um, that really enhances that gray bark. And then uh, going into the fall, uh, oftentimes, even even here in Atlanta, it'll get kind of shades of, uh, ours tend to turn a little yellow. I think some turn a reddish color, but ours uh, tend to be a little bit more yellow. Um, but like I said, a really great small flowering tree that uh, is is quite unusual. A lot of people don't know this tree very well. Uh, I will say if if you're going to to grow this tree, um, it does not like a lot of wind and it doesn't like heavy clay or rocky soils. So if you have a spot that's a little protected from some wind, you know, maybe around some other trees, it also uh, prefers a, probably a little bit of shade. It doesn't like the the hot blazing, particularly afternoon sun. So if you put it in a little bit of shade, a little bit of wind block with some um, kind of organically rich soil, that's going to be where it's it's the happiest. Um, there are a handful of cultivars out there, um, some a little easier to find than others, but the straight species is, is really totally worth it to me. I think I haven't mentioned yet that it's uh, about a zone five to eight. We're a little bit on its more southern end, um, but growing it in a little bit more shade helps and giving it a little bit more water um, helps that we're on, on the hotter end of it, its range. But I have seen it grow a little deeper than us, um, a little further south than Atlanta. And it's uh, 
multi-stemmed. I mentioned before you can grow it as a small tree or kind of a large shrub. So if you don't prune it up for a single trunk, you can just let it be a, a large shrub branched all the way to the bottom. Really beautiful that way. A um, little bit more um, look of a camellia when you let it grow that way. But if you want to train it into a single trunk, it definitely makes a really uh, kind of oval shaped small tree. And you can really see the exfoliating bark when you prune it up like that. Really, really stellar. And the last tree I want to talk about today is Hamamallis virginiana or common witch hazel. It's called common witch hazel, although I don't think that there is um, a lot common <laughs> about this uh, particular tree. Small tree, large shrub, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as well, depending on how you treat it. This has a huge range. Um, I would venture to say the vast majority of the eastern United States, although it does extend uh, over into eastern Texas, can grow this tree or, or has this tree natively. Um, it is where witch hazel is um, distilled from, so it, it has that great medicinal use as well. But this one is, is one that blooms in the fall and even into the winter. So different, um, depending on where you are, there's some variability with the, the blooming, but it, it can bloom, you know, in, into uh, fall going into winter. Um, often these trees bloom yellow. There are a couple couple of cultivars out there that don't bloom yellow, um, but they also will often retain their leaves. So it can be a little hard to see the yellow flowers with the, I find it an attractive winter color. It's, they do turn a bright yellow in the fall. So you have the yellow foliage, you have the yellow flowers, most of them are yellow. And then the leaves kind of fade to like a really light brown, almost kind of a beach color. They're, they're, a really nice color until way later in the winter and even in, into the spring. Um, one cultivar, Harvest Moon, can shed its leaves a little bit better than some of the others. But for those of you who have quite a bit of time on your hands, you can go through and cut the leaves off so that you can see the flowers. It won't hurt the plant at all. Those leaves are going to get pushed off in the spring anyway, so um, you can actually see the flowers a little bit better. Um, but man, this is this is such a pretty and attractive native tree that I think a lot of people don't know and don't use in their gardens. I think a lot of people are also a little afraid to use this plant in their garden. Um, they've gotten a little bit of a reputation of being a little finicky, although I will say um, the biggest thing with these trees is that they get some consistent moisture. Um, when we plant them here in Atlanta, we don't um, heavily amend the soil. We just make sure where they're at has a, a good amount of organic matter, um, but moreover, really has consistent moisture and doesn't have a lot of root competition from a lot of other mature trees to soak all that moisture up. That's really the key to these plants. They are native often to lowland areas or streamsides, so they get the consistent moisture in the um, kind of, you know, more loamier soils that you find near water, but um, that's not an absolute requirement for them. They just do want that um, consistent moisture. Deer also don't like them because of the, that witch hazel component that's inside the tree, that medicinal component. So they tend to leave them alone a little bit more as well. But beautiful tree, like I said, native, huge range, which also means it uh, grows in a variety of zones uh, in the U.S. Al almost the entire East Coast can, can grow these can be grown as, as a small tree. So if you prune it and really limb it up and, and raise its canopy to, to walk under it or near it, it can be grown that way. Really in, in its native habitat wants to grow as like a large shrub, almost kind of thicket styled so that it branches very low and it kind of has a really large presence. But often in the landscape, you don't want it to, to keep its totally natural habit. And that's fine. It takes to pruning really well. 15, 20, maybe 25 feet in that range, ultimate size after a while. But if you care for it, uh, this one is one that will really start blooming in fall when you have your other asters and 
some of the other fall blooming perennials out, this tree will go into bloom and just kind of amp up all of that fall feeling and that you're really headed into the season and persist past some of those perennials that are blooming. Um, it can frost and even freeze and these trees will still be into bloom. So kind of extending your season, especially if your winters are a little longer, a little grayer, this one will give you some flowers to enjoy um, going in later. The wildlife love it. Birds and small mammals really uh, enjoy having this tree around as well. So it's a great one if you have one of those backyard habitat type areas. Um, and it's a great tree just kind of to have in your yard and enjoy um, later in the season. It has a beautiful leaf shape and a, and a lovely habit all year, but it really is spectacular when it starts going into bloom in the fall when so many other trees are, you know, have their fall color and are kind of going to sleep. This one seems like it's just now starting to come alive. Thanks for talking to me today about uh, some of the small flowering trees for every season that are particular favorites of mine. I have many others. Sometimes these topics are a bit like choosing your favorite child, but at least one per season gave a, a little bit of a range for me to, to choose some of them from. And I hope that you're growing some of these. And if not, I hope that this has sparked interest and that you may look into some of these for your garden. All right, whenever we have these experts that are from more southern locations, especially when they talk about fall and winter plants, I have such zone envy. Yes, although I don't, honestly don't know if I would move to Atlanta just so I could grow these cool plants, but boy, if you're there, you have got a lot of choices. It's so cool. You do. Yeah, let me rethink this because August in Atlanta sounds a little rough. 